Welcome to Church of the Apostles, where all people and all questions are welcome. As we continue in this Lenten series of entering the passion of Jesus, and as we continue to allow our hearts and our minds, our spirits and our all to be open even more fully to the love that God has poured into this world through his son, Jesus. As we enter into this time of worship, there are some announcements that I want to share with you. The first is that there are now three weeks remaining in the season of Lent. And if you haven't had the opportunity to join in some of our Wednesday spiritual growth opportunities, there is still time to do that. The first one occurs on Wednesday at 10 o'clock in the morning. It's based upon the DVD series that Amy Jill Levine has put together of Entering the Passion of Jesus. It's what our worship series is based upon. Later that evening at 6.30 p.m., you can join us for the Lenten Vesper service. And then immediately following that at 7 o'clock, there is a second book study of Everything is Spiritual. To join in with these, simply contact the church office so that we can provide you with the Zoom links to join in with either of these three opportunities. Also, I want to let you know that there is still time and open spots to sign up for the Easter drive-through scavenger hunt that we're having for youth and, and young individuals. That's going to be held on Saturday, March 27th. And again, look to the E! Weekly announcements or contact the church office so that you can get signed up for that event. It is one that requires a registration, so make sure that you register for it. And then you've probably seen in the announcements preceding the worship today, in the bulletin, or even within our newsletters, that we will be resuming in-person worship this April. It will start Holy Week with some outdoor worship opportunities, and then on April 11th, we'll be inviting people into the sanctuary at our 10 a.m. worship service. As we do enter into the spirit of worship, I invite you to breathe in deeply with me and to release any worries, any anxieties, any concerns, anything that might keep you from the living presence of God. And to breathe in again the life, the blessing, the joy that God seeks to pour into the lives of each of us. And then as the music begins to play, I invite you to light a candle in whatever way is most appropriate for you. A reminder of the spirit that is uniting us and moving through us. And then to continue to breathe in that life and blessing, being centered in God's holy presence. The last week of Jesus' life, referred to as the Passion of Christ, is where Jesus' life and work culminate. These are the events of Holy Week, beginning with Palm Sunday, where we see the strength of his conviction to love us during the cruelest of times, through betrayal, abandonment, and denial. We also see in the lives of his disciples and those closest to him that for many, 
what they say does not match what they do. This Lenten season, as we focus on these events which are pivotal to our faith, we invite you into the story as an observer to learn more about Jesus Christ and your faithfulness to him. Please join me in the call to worship. Besides the Last Supper, Holy Week contains another important story that happens at a dinner. Earlier in the week, Jesus and his followers gathered for a meal, and a woman shows up unexpectedly to anoint Jesus in an extravagant show of devotion. To say she caused quite a stir might be understating a bit. We imagine ourselves in the room and we see the looks of judgment and even outrage on the face around us. Are we ourselves moved by her generosity and outpouring of emotion? Or are we uncomfortable as Jesus refers to his own death? Does our complaining to uh, does our complaining or anger really serve to hide our own fear. Jesus invites us to tell the story in remembrance of her. What uncomfortable stories are we called to tell in our time? Let us pray together. You entered our story through Jesus. Now help us to enter fully into the story of your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Amen.
every time prophets and apostles have come calling God's people to repentance, calling God's people to renewal of relationship that healing and life might enter in. Let us together confess of our sin and allow God's healing to stream into each of us. Will you join me in our response of prayer? We confess, gracious God, that we are not worthy of your love for us. You speak speak to to us through through your prophets, prophets, telling us how our rebellion hurts and angers you. Yet we harden our hearts and close our ears. You come to us in Jesus, revealing your love for all people and suffering pain for us. Still, we do not turn in love and obedience to you. Speak the word, O God, and we shall be made free. Forgive us, receive us, and give us courage to serve you with renewed hearts and wills through the grace of Jesus Christ. Do not fear, says our Lord and our God. In the name of Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. We are welcomed into the life and the healing that is of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Tu mamina, tu mamina, tu mamina. Send me, Lord, send me Jesus, send me Jesus, send me Jesus, send me Lord, lead me, Lord, lead me Jesus, lead me Jesus, lead me Jesus, lead me Lord, me, Lord, fill me Jesus. Fill me, Jesus, fill me, Jesus, fill me, Lord. 
So this is our time for our children, for our young at heart, and, and anyone else who wants to join with me. Um, we are doing some fun journeying into the scriptures. But we want to start, as we have been, with our repeat after me prayer, with, its mo with the motions. So, would you start with your hands on your heart, and repeat after me. We will dare to join the journey. We will walk your loving way. We will live your sacred story. Through the things we do and say. Amen. And so now we've been playing with the story, the stories, and today what I have for you is um, when you hear something good happen in a story, I want you to say, Amen. And when you hear something that's not good, I want you to go, Oh, man. Okay? So if it's good, you go, amen. And if it's not so good, oh, man. Okay? Close, not quite the same. So here's the story. It was two days before Passover and the festival of the unleavened bread. Oh, man. Oh, man. <laughs> and Jesus was at Bethany visiting the house of Simon, who had a skin disease. Oh, man. During dinner, a woman came in with a vase containing a very expensive perfume. And she broke the vase and poured the perfume on Jesus' head as a way to honor him. Amen. But some of the men grew angry. Oh, man. They said to each other, Why are you wasting this perfume? This could have been sold for almost a whole, week, a whole year's worth of wages and given to the poor. And they scolded the woman. Oh, man. Jesus defended her, saying, Leave her alone. Amen. Why do you make trouble for her? She has done a good thing for me. Amen. You will always have the poor with you. And wherever you want, you can, whenever you want, you can do good things for them. But you won't always have me. Oh, man. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body for burial I tell you the truth, that anywhere in the world the good news is announced. What she has done will be told in memory of her. Amen. Great job. We celebrate this woman today because she took a chance. She, she had the courage to act out of her faith to show her love for Jesus. And she did a really, really courageous thing. And so I want you to think now, if you were really courageous and Jesus was here, what gift would you give to Jesus? What would you want to do for Jesus? Think about that. And think about, even though Jesus isn't here, what gift can you still give to Jesus? Now, take a deep breath, and will you join me in our repeat-after-me prayer to close this time? Loving God, help us live your story as we learn it is not foolish 
to give out of love. Amen. Our scripture reading today is a great follow-up to the uh, children's uh, message this morning. The story of the woman with the alabaster jar appears in all four Gospels. Usually that means that it's a such an ordinary, extraordinary moment that no one would forget. Not only that, Jesus makes a point to instruct those present to remember this woman. Alongside this story today, let us hear the psalmist, who also speaks of extravagant love and presence in the midst of the valleys of the shadows of death. The tradition of anointing with oil goes back a long way in this psalm. The image of being bathed in oil is set at a table on which an overflowing cup symbolizes the kind of love we are to emulate as children of God and disciples of Jesus. And now listen to the words of the psalmist in the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He lets me rest in grassy meadows. He leads me to restful waters. He keeps me alive. He guides me in proper paths for the sake of his good name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no danger because you are with me. Your rod and your staff they protect me. You set a table before me right in front of my enemies. You bathe my head in oil. My cup is so full it spills over. Yes, goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the Lord's house as long as I live. Holy words, holy wisdom. Thanks be to God. So I begin my sermon today with an old, old story about a woman who was trying to understand who she was. She was in search of her identity, and she heard that there was a sage on this mountain near her. And so she decided to go the mount, to the mountain and learn from the sage who she was. So she started climbing the mountain, and she reached a cave. And she went into the cave and saw a person meditating. So she sat down quietly until they recognized her. And then she said to them, I'm trying to understand who I am. What can you tell me? And the person that was meditating said, Oh, that is, is more profound and, and beyond my skills. I can't tell you that. You will have to continue with your journey. So she went back out and climbed more of the mountain. And finally, she came across another cave. And so she went into this cave where she saw a saint sitting by a fire. And she went in and she sat down by the fire and, and looked at the saint and said, Can you help me? Do you know who I am? And the saint said, No. I'm sorry, I'm not wise enough to tell you that. You're going to have to continue your journey. So she went back out and a little frustrated, a bit disgusted, she continued, though, up the mountain until she reached the top. And on the top of the mountain, there was an old woman sitting on a rug and the old woman had, had the lines of age and wisdom on her face. And her hair was gray and thinning. 
And she went over to the old woman and she said, please tell me, who am I? And the old woman looked at her and said, who's asking? It's a story of identity. A lot of us question our identity. We, we want to know who we really are. And, and we try to define ourselves based on maybe who we're related to or the roles that we play, whether that we are a mother or a sister, or an uncle or a nephew. We might define ourselves based on our occupation or our profession, whether we are a lawyer or a teacher, a caregiver, a bookkeeper. But then we, if, if we define ourselves by what we do, then, then we reach those points like the point of retirement or sometimes something happens in life that stops us from being that thing. And we have this, this question of identity again. And who are we? I think that's important for us. I think it's important for us. And, and I think it's, it's a part of, this, of today's story. You see, there's a lot of, of women that are actually in the gospel stories and, and, and in the New Testament. There were a lot of women, although there's no women named as being of that, that first 12 disciples, there were a lot of women that followed Jesus around. And there were women who supported Paul's ministry, women like Dorcas and Lydia that he names in his writings. So we know that there were women who had financial means, who uh, did things like uh, they were in textile, in textiles or pottery. All of those things. And, but what we see today in this story is we see the story of a woman who took a chance on Jesus. She showed her courage and her faith by going to this meal and doing an extravagant piece of anointing Jesus' head with oil. This is, this is a, a story that actually takes place in all four Gospels, but has some very different uh, dynamics. This year, in our le this lectionary year, we do follow the lectionary, maybe more loosely than some, um, but the lectionary year is, is Mark's Gospel. So we're starting this from the position of what does Mark's Gospel say? And Mark's gospel is the oldest of the gospels. So Mark's gospel, it happens in chapter 14, verses 3 to 9. In Matthew's gospel, it is Matthew 26, verses 6 to 13. John's gospel, it's John 12, verses 1 to 8. And in Luke's gospel, it is 7, verses, chapter 7, verses 36 to 50. So I want to go back to Mark. So in Mark's gospel, we have this uninvited guest who comes in, breaks a jar of expensive perfume, and changes the whole scene. Matthew's gospel and, and Matthew used Mark as one of his sources for his gospel. Matthew's gospel follows pretty much the same storyline. 
There's a few differences, subtle differences. I'm going to let you check that out yourself. But then when we go to John's gospel, it's drastically different. Because now it's not just an unnamed woman who does this. This doesn't take place in, in the home of Simon the leper, but, but in the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And it is after the raising of Lazarus. So they've already experienced death, and they know what death smells like. Because smell is, is a really important part of this, of this text. And, and here in, in John's gospel, John has Mary, the sister, who knows Jesus, anoint Jesus' feet with this expensive perfume, this myrrh. I wish you all were here so that you could smell the myrrh, because I have myrrh. It's an essential oil. Um, shout out to Stephanie Rampall. I got the oils from her. But um, this oil, this would have change the whole aroma in the room. And so that, that changes the dynamic. And then in Luke's gospel, it doesn't come at the end. It doesn't come. So for, for Matthew and Mark, this story comes right before the Last Supper. And, and for, for John, it is, it's, it's in that area too. It's leading up. It, for John, it's right before he walks into Jerusalem. But for Luke, he puts it much earlier in, in the gospel. He puts it during, in the middle of Jesus' teachings and ministry. And for Luke... Luke has an unnamed woman who comes in. And this unnamed woman is looking for forgiveness. Now, unfortunately, this un, right after that scripture, in chapter 8, we get an introduction to Mary Magdalene, who had, is named as a woman who had seven demons. And we hear about Joanna, who also followed Jesus, and some other women who f were followers of Jesus, even though they're not named as disciples. And through time, and as Pastor Motes reminded us in the very beginning, the fact that we really don't know the stories as well as we think we do, we just think we know what they say, these stories have been put together so that the woman who anoints Jesus' feet, and then his feet in Luke, has become Mary Magdalene, even though it, that's not what it says. And because she, it was a woman who needed forgiveness, somewhere along history and tradition, somebody decided she was a prostitute, even though that is also not in scripture. There's nothing in scripture about Mary Magdalene being a prostitute, and there's nothing in scripture about this woman who is anointing Jesus as being a prostitute, except that maybe the people at the dinner were uncomfortable because of her display of affection towards Jesus. The picture that I have chosen to go with this is probably a picture based on John's gospel. This is probably, I, and I'm saying that because the woman is anointing Jesus' feet as opposed to Jesus' head. I didn't find one of those. Um, and I'm thinking that this woman, this it looks like 
the man sitting um, at the end of the table across from Jesus is watching what she's doing. And I could see that as her brother watching what she is doing. But it also could be, um, and, and actually it's named, a Mary, Mary anoints Jesus' feet. So that, that also kind of clues in probably John's gospel. Um, or it could be that the artist thought it was Mary Magdalene in Luke's gospel, and that the man overlooking her is the Pharisee whose home they were dining in. There's a lot of uncertainties in this. It's not exactly clear. But what is clear is that the party was interrupted. There was a dinner party. So I want, I want you to imagine yourself that you are at a dinner party with friends and all of a sudden someone you do not know comes in to the party and showers one of the guests, not the host, with affection. Because we don't, I mean, I could say, how would you feel if they poured oil on, the, on a person's head? But you probably would really have a reaction to that. But I think even if you, if a woman came in and was affectionate to one of the guests that wasn't the host, how would you feel? How would you react? I'm guessing that you would not have had a good reaction to this unwanted person at the party who seems to be crashing the party in a whole different way, not just trying to sneak in for the free food. But Jesus was different. Jesus was so powerful and he meant so much to her that she was willing to risk everything to do that. As we listen to this scene and put ourselves in this scene, we may have visions, if you're, if you're of a certain age, you may have visions of Jesus Christ Superstar. And you may hear that Mary singing, I don't know how to love him. This whole dinner party was disrupted. And like I said, whatever they were eating, that smell, the aroma of the food, would have been probably overwhelmed by the smell of this myrrh oil flowing off of his head. So the people at the dinner party, their initial reaction is out of concern for her stewardship, that she was wasteful, but that she was wasteful in such a way means that she came out of financial means to have enough to feed a family for a year for, for enough money invested in probably a larger jar than this a jar of oil that could sustain a family for the money Okay, not the oil, but the money could sustain a family for a year. If she could give that kind of money away, that means that she was not a poor woman. She was one of these who had property and money and may have been supporting Jesus' ministry. She may have done textile work or pottery. She may have been a healer or even an investor. This is a different time. We often talk about how in the 
in the Hebrew Testament that women had, didn't have the ability to, to own property and, and so forth. But in the New Testament, that's not true anymore. Now in Judea and Galilee, women do have those things. The Greeks, the Greek women have these things too. And Jesus' reaction to this is one of acceptance. And actually, not, not only does he accept her gift, but he lifts her up. He lifts her up and says, she will be remembered always. Whenever the good news is proclaimed, she will be remembered for her gift. And yet we don't. Or she, her story gets, gets mixed in with all the other stories, all the other versions. Or she's accused of being a prostitute. So I just want you to stop and think, why don't we remember her? What's that about? So here's to all of the unnamed women in the gospel. To Peter's mother-in-law, who only gets named by her association to Peter, who Jesus heals, and she gets up and serves everyone dinner. Here's to the Canaanite and, or the Syrophoenician woman, depending on the version you're reading who challenges Jesus because she believes that Jesus' love and mercy is more inclusive than he does. And she changes his mind. And here's to the widow of Nain, whose only son died, and she was about to be destitute. But Jesus has compassion for her. And brings her son back to life. Here's to the bent over woman who went into the synagogue knowing that she was unclean because of bleeding for so many years. And yet has the faith that if she will just touch his garment, she will be made whole again. And she does. And it happens that she is made well. And here's to the Samaritan woman who has had too many broken relationships, but who hears Jesus and wants that living water to quench her thirst so that she will thirst no more. Here's to the chutzpah of a woman who walked into a party to which she was not invited. Maybe we don't know her name, but we know her courage and her faith. We know who you are, unnamed woman. Because you are us, and we are you. Cherished, worthy, enough. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you.
And will you join me now in a word of prayer? Holy One, our Lord Jesus Christ, your love for us brings us to our knees. So many places tell us that we are not loved, not worthy, not enough. Today we celebrate all of the faithful whose names did not make the scriptures, whose stories happened after the Bible was written, whose encounters with the divine were not even believed. You are the good shepherd who looks after us, and we show our gratitude with our devotion to you. We give thanks for some beautiful weather this week to remind us that your creation is about to have its own resurrection once again. We give thanks for the downtown breakfast ministry where we can meet those who are hungry and fill their need. We give thanks for additional vaccines becoming available to the many more who are still in need. We also bring those whom we carry on our hearts because of illness or death. We name Carol Burkholder, Molly Reinhardt, Dorothy Freeman, Barbara B Ochterman, a friend of Cam Ficus, a friend of Laurie Williams, Elizabeth Stoltzfus' cousin and her partner, and Joyce Baker's friend. For the families and friends of Paul Mason, Dale Zabel, Charlie Diller, Harriet Latcher, and Bob Hilliard, and for my family with the death of my brother-in-law. We trust in your presence. We trust in your love. We trust in your mercy. So hear us today as we pray the way you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. With hearts wide open and ears ready to hear, we bring our hearts and our minds to respond to God's voice. As you consider the gifts that you are called to give this day in support of the ministry that God has called this church to, we invite you to watch this video that is about our March special offering of one great hour sharing because you can give to this special offering the same ways that you can give to our congregation, either by mailing a check to the church or going to apostlesucc.org give to give electronically or even using our Give, Plus, our give Plus app. In whatever way you give, thank you for joining with others in hearing and responding to the living word of God in our midst. You can't hide love. It shows up where you least expect it, in places where food is scarce, in the rubble of a disaster's aftermath, where water is hard to come by, where home is a tent in a foreign land, in the middle of a pandemic. Love seeks us out. 
One Great Hour of Sharing has sought to minister to people in need all over the world for more than 70 years. The work we have done behind the scenes responding to disasters, feeding the hungry, providing water to the thirsty, and empowering those who have been marginalized may not make headlines. But eventually, you just can't hide love. Join us in our pursuit to show God's love all over the world. Give to one great hour of sharing. that we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us run with perseverance and faith towards the path that God sets before all of us. And be encouraged by the love of God, renewed by the grace of Christ, and empowered by the presence of the Holy Spirit now and always. Amen.